may be getting. You can't always. This is the death. Remarkably him. Turn back. Towards God. Rise up. Hi, I'm Veronica Statch. Welcome to Shalom World's original program, Jesus My Savior, where we give you moving conversion journeys from all over the world. Our guest's love for visual arts led him to photography, which eventually sparked his journey to becoming the senior photography editor of Playboy magazine for 18 years. His perception of beauty and success really began to change when God intervened. Let us welcome Kevin Custer. Hi, my name is Kevin Custer. I'm one of the founding members of Watts of Love and the former uh, creative director. Um, I have a wife, Sherry, a son, Caden, and a son, Brady. Um, I'm going to share with you a little bit of my journey, my testimony, uh, my transformation. Um, as a younger person, um, I was raised with faith and I, I had faith, but I completely, um, as I grew, I just completely abandoned my faith. I didn't have time for God. Um, I didn't have time for a relationship and I just made my life completely about me and what I wanted to do. Um, then at, uh, at some point in time later in my life, I, I had a number of tragic events that kind of happened um, and it really, um, it opened my heart uh, and changed me forever. And it was at that time um, that I, uh, came back to my faith and thankfully through his grace and understanding he was there for me and completely embraced me um, and it, uh, it changed my life forever um, and you know now I have the opportunity to share my testimony tell my story um, and uh, and serve people in a way that I never thought I would and I find it uh, completely humbling uh, that through His grace and through His power, um, I'm able to help others by sharing my story, sharing my testimony, and using my gifts and my talents to make a small change in the world. So um, I hope you enjoy my testimony and uh, always know that He loves you. Hi, Kevin. It is so good to have you with us today. Thanks so much, Veronica. I'm really excited to be here. You grew up with the faith. And then you sort of drifted away as you became a young adult. What was your Catholic formation like early on growing up? So um, I did 12 years of Catholic schooling, uh, grade school and high school. Um, you know, Catholic education was really important to my, my parents. Um, so they really uh, made it, um, you know, uh, it was very important in our house. Uh, our faith and, you know, extremely important that we attend, uh, you know, Catholic school, not only from an education standpoint of view, but also just from the religious education and kind of developing your faith. So what would you say started your sort of drifting away from God and more so towards the world? How did that start? So I don't think my drift from my faith was, um, you know, really a conscious choice. Uh, at least not one that I'm looking back on it really thought of, think that it was. It was just a number of um, small steps that slowly just began to erode my faith um, and just um, make it seem less relevant and less important in my life. And then when I kind of look at the markers of it, right, I was, I was a young person who had faith. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, you I, I very much trusted Jesus. I kind of knew who he was or thought I did. You know, God the Father didn't really understand him other than you got to look out for him, right? He's, he's kind of he's powerful and he might get you, right? More of the uh, um, Old Testament understanding of the Father. And then the Holy Spirit, um, you know, I just, I, I couldn't understand him emotionally or intellectually. I just, I didn't get it. Um, 
you know, so that's kind of how I was, you know, in my formative years, that's how I felt. Um, and I did feel uh, in grade school and through high school um, that I had a calling in my life that I felt like there was a, a, a calling in my life and a prompt in my life that I, that I thought about a life of service. Um, I thought about, you know, being a, um, a priest or in, in, when I was in, in high school, I was taught by the Christian brothers. And uh, I thought about becoming a Christian brother or a priest, um, a life of service and kind of helping other people was a little bit on my heart. Um, so my faith was very important to me, um, and I relied upon it a lot. And then when I went away to college, um, you know, kind of like in that environment, it just started to, um, you know, erode more and more, right? Um, I, started, uh, I started a life that was kind of about pleasure, you know, going out and drinking, having fun, um, and kind of just doing the things that I wanted to do. and. It was like, ah, well, you know, Sunday, don't really have time, right? Don't have time to go to church. Not really interested, you know, not feeling inspired. So it was just easy for me to just kind of turn away from it. Um, and in some respects, it was um, uh, probably even worse where you then at that time, rather than walking out your faith, you kind of, I had a little bit of faith. But it was like, in some res respects, it was like, you know, you become a hypocrite, right? Like you, you, you have an understanding of faith, but yet you do the opposite. Um, and I think that that was one of those things where um, I just didn't see the value in it by my, and, and, and that was reflected through my choices. How did your life start to look as you started to slowly climb that ladder and eventually became the senior photography editor for Playboy. How did your life start to look as you, uh, yeah, went up that ladder? I think I really, uh, I, I wanted to be a good employee, right? I wanted to um, do well. I wanted to, like anybody, like I, I wanted to move up the ladder, right? I wanted to move up the ladder. I wanted to be successful. Um, and then slowly, you know, that life really became about me. At one point in time, once you attain that, you know, that level of, of notoriety, right, the senior photo editor, it's, it's a title that, that in the world has some real um, authority, real power. Um, you know, it was one of those things where, um, you know, you'd go to a party, you'd go to an event, and people would be like, I'd introduce myself, and they'd be like, oh, you're that guy. You're that guy that works at Playboy, right? So it was like you started to, or I started to live my life through my identity of my job. It sounds like it. it sounds like like you were on top of the world. So what what shattered that reality, and then brought you face to face with God? So um, I felt like my career was moving along great. Um, I was married, I had a, a little boy, um, had a certain amount of um, uh, celebrity, uh, had some money in my pocket, and I felt like life was great, like I was doing really well. Um, I, and, but I really just didn't have time for God, right? I would still be like, well, I'm a good person, right? But like, in terms of like living out my faith or making my faith important to me, it was just, uh, completely non-existent. Um, and, you know, unfortunately with the marriage, there were some intervening problems um, that, uh, you know, happened and, and the marriage ended. Um, and it was, uh, it was devastating to me. You know, you, you, sometimes when you, when you fall to your knees and you're not sure how you're going to move forward or if you want to live and you, and you fall to your knees and the only place you can look is up and he's there waiting for you. And you experience grace. It's powerful. 
powerful, you know. And despite my, uh, <clears throat> despite like my own choices and what I did, like he was just there waiting for me, you know, just waiting to embrace me. So didn't deserve it. Didn't do anything to deserve it. Um, but uh, when you experience God's grace and love like that, it, uh, it changes your life forever. Where did you experience this? This beautiful realization that God's mercy was there for you, that, that his arms were open to you. Where did you get to come to experience this after, after such a struggle and such when, when your life imploded? I was in a lot of pain. Uh, you know, emotionally and physically, um, and everything was closing in down on me. You know, uh, I, I had all these financial difficulties. Um, I, I was in the process of going through a divorce. I, uh, I, I was suddenly become a single parent with a, uh, a, a young son, and just my life was closing in on me. I had... Um, I don't know, out of nowhere, I, right around Christmas, I had this, um, I had this feeling to, to go to confession. And uh, it just came over me pretty strong. And, um, you know, I went and the church was pretty full. And I was just so afraid. And uh, the priest is just waiting, right? And it's like, well, Either I'm going to do this or not, right? I mean, it's like, this is what you came for. Um, and I walked up to him and uh, couldn't get the words out. Didn't know what to say. You know, I, I just sat there and, uh, and cried. And he said, uh, I hear the words prodigal son. He said, your sins are forgiven. And he, uh, he blessed me and I left. And then, uh, I, you know, I was still in all of my pain and difficulty, but I'd had that very profound experience, you know. And a couple months later, um, I, had, uh, I had broken my ankle. I, uh, I had gone up on a 25 foot ladder looking for what I thought were answers in a very weird situation. And the ladder went over and I fell 25 feet backwards and, uh, shattered my ankle. And, um, then, uh, not only am I in an emotional state, a physical state, just everything is just really bad. And someone had suggested to me at this church, um, St. Dennis Church, they were having a, a healing conference. And they were recommended that I go. So I go to this conference and they're talking about, you know, how accessible God is and how he wants to speak to you. and heal you and help you and and i'm sitting in the back of the church because i'm like if this if this gets really weird or if this gets strange like i won't be able to get out of here right and uh you know they finally said okay so everybody come up and we're we're going to pray for you and um you know whatever you want so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go up and I'm going to pray about my ankle. And I start walking up there <laughs> and I see this woman who's praying for people. And I'm like, okay, I definitely don't want her to pray for me, right? Because she's, she looks like uh, the type of person that would be a principal of a school, right? She looks like she's got some authority. She looks like she's, you know, kind of tough. And I'm sitting there going, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to go to that person. And sure enough, as I get closer, I'm standing there and she goes, 
and pulls me over to her. And I was like, oh, this is like the one person I don't want to do this. And she looks right at me and she goes, do the words prodigal son mean anything to you? Because I keep hearing those words over and over again. Couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it, you know. I just sat there and we talked and I cried. <clears throat> and I kid you not, I, I know it doesn't sound truthful, but as we're done talking, she's like, well, my name is Mary. And this is my husband, Joseph. I'm like, wait, Mary and Joseph? And they both laugh, you know. And uh, so I wanted, I, I, I couldn't believe what had happened. And they encouraged everybody to come back the next day to continue the healing conference. And I went, and the man who was the team of people that were praying for people, the guy running the conference, all of a sudden says, you know, I was praying, and, I, and I'm going to do things different tonight. Rather than praying for healing, I'm going to pray to release the baptism of the Holy Spirit for people. So he makes that announcement, and I like beeline to the front, and we're we're in this in this gymnasium in the church, you know, right next to the church. And I go right up to him, and he gets to me, and rather than coming to me, he steps to the left, to the person to my left. So now, rather than being first, I'm last because he's going to go all around the room, right? He's going to go all the way around the room, and I'm going to be the last person now. So um, I have to wait, you know? And uh, at that time, I just, I really lost the ability to pray. You know, I just, I just, I, I, the only thing I could really do is like kind of say the Our Father and the Hail Mary, right? And I was like, okay, well, well I'm just going to do that as I'm waiting, right? Like kind of pass my time and um, I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, they it takes a really long time, but they get around to me. And my eyes are closed and I can feel something around me. And... I can sense that people are around me and they're praying for me. I kept crying out, right? I was crying really hard. And I was very aware of my tears and my crying out. And it was like, oh my God, like I'm embarrassing myself, right? Like there's all these people in this gym and I'm on the ground, I'm crying out, but I, I can't stop. And the best way I can describe it was there was electricity all around me and in my body and on my hands. I could feel it. It was all around me. And I don't know how long I was there, but it was quite some time. And, and the feeling, the presence started to diminish. It started to, you know, reduce. And I remember in my heart saying, no, 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 please don't go away. And I heard the words, I'll never leave you. <laughs> and around this time, did you, had you already quit working at Playboy? And um, I know that you started I co-founded a non-for-profit uh, called Watts of Love. Was this all after these experiences? So once I kind of closed that entire world behind me, that's where then um, Watts of Love came. God basically put that in our lives. Um, my sister had gone to the Philippines and had been introduced to a young girl 
who was horrifically burned by kerosene. Um, she and her husband were there on a trip. You know, like most people uh, in you know the United States, we have no idea that people uh, burn kerosene at night to have light. Um, and so many people are burned by the kerosene, injured by the kerosene, and really the kerosene keeps people in in you know locked in poverty because they're they're spending money at night in order to have light by buying kerosene. Um, so after I had left Playboy, she felt very called that she's like, you know, I'm feeling like I should bring light to these people. And so she, um, her husband and I went to the Philippines and we distributed lights. Um, and we really had no idea the profound impact that these lights would have on people's lives. And it was really obvious to me that uh, he wanted to take all of my gifts and talents and skills that I had learned at my old job. And he wanted to be like, okay, now you're gonna do this for me. And now you're gonna tell stories and capture pictures and videos and share stories with people that believe that they have been forgotten. I see more beauty and I see so much joy and love and compassion in these people that we serve than any other person or place I've ever been in my previous life. Um, I am so humbled to tell their story and to capture their picture. I feel like your story, your story is such a testament to God's overwhelming mercy and just how it's never too late. It's never too late to come home. Uh, like the prodigal son, that theme is, is so pro it's so prominent in my life. And it, it not only spoke to me, but I'm sure it will to so many people. So thank you so much for really showing us how it's never too late. It's never too late. And our beloved father's arms are just wide open. Thank you so much. Thank you, appreciate it. To all of the viewers of Shalom TV throughout the world, I want to encourage you not only to support this amazing media apostolate, but to spread the word to others. We all know how the internet and mass media are polluting the world with the poison of pornography and so much other forms of materialism. This is the source of eternal life, the gospel, and Shalom TV is consecrated to spreading the word of Christ. Thank you.